Aliha. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all the guests to the special lecture for Inspiration in Science by the 2010 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, Professor Eiji Nekichi. My name is Natapon Chate. And I am Pita Chio Wong. We will be your uh, Master of Ceremonies for today's event. And on behalf of the organizers, we are on, um, we are, we we'll welcome you all to this remarkable event. And before we begin the lecture, actually today there is something very special. As you could see that there is the whiteboard on the stage. And there will be some quizzes for us. So get yourself back to be a student again. Yes, and the quiz will be before the lecture. So right before the lecture, there will be some quiz from Professor so uh, is the stage ready? Let's give them a moment to prepare for all the technical issue and then once we are ready, uh, we'll continue with the official opening of this event. very fun the next I chain because this is really unprecedented. I just learned a few minutes ago that before the lecture we will have some quiz from uh, Professor Nijishi so everyone can participate and we learned that we have actually two, one or two prizes for the winner or the, the, those who can answer the quiz correctly. Yes, the prize will be very special. It was prepared by Professor Nijishi. We actually don't know what the prize will be. And we, as well, um, can we be the competitor among them? Assume that you are a chemist. Well, because I'm completely in the field of uh, organometallic, so I will opt myself out in this case, so I'm not going to participate. But, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity is open to everyone, especially for students. So now it's the best time to review your basic chemistry knowledge. I'm sure that the quiz won't be too difficult or too hard. Um, probably utilize some of your basic chemistry knowledge. So, high school physics would work. I would say I can see several high school students in this hall, so well, get yourself ready. Yeah, as long as they took a few chemistry courses in the past, that should be fine, I think. Okay, um, can I ask you a few questions since we are sure. doing chemistry for today? So could you explain roughly what Professor Negishi found out in 2000, I mean before 2010 because you received oh, okay. the big prize? Of course, usually uh, the, it's one of the, the most important discovery in organic chemistry because usually uh, when we talk about, we think about organic synthesis we think about the formation of carbon and carbon bond. And usually carbon is a very stable, you know, inert element. So to join them together to make a, a covalent bond between two carbon atoms is not an easy task. One should activate the carbon and there's so many ways to do it. But at the same time, there are a lot of um, um, difficulties and also limitations. So his discovery um, allows us to join carbon in any kind of form, different type of carbon, carbon with a triple bond, double bond, and single bond together. So this is very, very, and I would say extremely useful for the synthesis of organic compound and can be applied to several fields in science, including pharmaceutical and also the material science. Can I ask you, is it possible for me to form something like graphene? or even diamond, this way, oh. as a woman. I don't, I don't think you need to do that using uh, his reaction because um, usually, uh, I would say his reaction and you know, the, the, the Nikishi coupling is very versatile and can be used in several other applications. So when you want to form 
um, in S P two carbon in graphene or even a carbon nanotube. There are several other ways that are simpler to do it. Okay. So I would be here as a physicist. So I have a few questions for for you and for professor, okay. as someone who doesn't know well in the field. And in the meantime, I think we're waiting for all our distinguished guests. And what I have in my hand is a short summary of Professor Negishi um, CV. Accomplishment. Yes, uh, I don't have his I only the Nobel laureate that I have in my hands. But what I have is that he is actually graduated from the University of Tokyo, one of the best universities in Japan in 1958, and he did his internship in Taijing. And also, later on, he went for a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania yeah, in 1963. Pennsylvania. And then for the rest of his life, he spent most of his time at the University. And I realized that he was actually working with the Nobel Laureate, Herbert C. Brown. Yeah, and he's very famous in the field of organic um, chemistry as well. So he's best known for the utilization of a boron compound for organic synthesis, and also various kind of um, reactions, including reduction and also hydroxylation. So Nobel Laureate turns for even more Nobel laureate. And I suppose yes. Professor Negishi right. could even produce even more Nobel laureate in the yes. near future as a student. So I got the actually I got an opportunity to meet with uh, Professor Negishi and Madame Negishi last night at the Japan um, Embassy, uh, and um, he mentioned that um, he has a very solid goal when he was a graduate student. And this is also part of the reason why he went on and worked with uh, Herbert C. Brown because um, he's very, very intelligent and at the same time he's a Nobel laureate. So, and who would believe that you know one day he would become one as well? So, it's a very inspiring story that the, uh, the Faculty of Science Professor Dr. Sukhan Han Yonghua to address the report. Please welcome the Dean of the Faculty of Science. Professor Dr. Pradeen Rasamite, Vice President for Siracha Campus, Kaseza University. Dr. Pairin Chucho Thawon, CEO of PTT. On behalf of Faculty of Science, Kaseza University, and all the participants gathered here today, may I express my attitude to Professor Eichi Negeji the 2010 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry to give a special lecture for inspiration in science on an, an occasion of the 72nd anniversary celebration of Kaseza University and the fifth Asian event series which dialogues towards a culture of peace. It is indeed a great honor and privilege for Faculty of Science to have the opportunity to play a leading role in organizing this prestigious event. The goal for this event is to encourage the inspiration in science for our young generation as we do believe that inspiration would spark innovation and a drive for discovery. It is indeed a great honor that Professor Dr. Eiji Negiji, the Nobel laureate for chemistry, will gradually deliver a special lecture entitled The Power of Metal Catalyst Transition for a Prosperous and Sustainable 21st Century, right after the opening ceremony. In addition, this event is attended by over 600 participants from different high schools, universities, institutions, 
from the government and also the industry in Thailand. With pioneer research of our guest speaker, the world has gained much from his finding. We wish that the experience and knowledge from our speaker will inspire all of us for the great achievement and for the future development of science in Thailand. Mr. Vice President, on behalf of the organizers of the Inspiration in Science program, may I present Mr. Uwe Morowitz, the chairman of the International Peace Foundation, and then Dr. Pairin Chu Chothawon, the president and CEO of PPT, to deliver their addresses. And may I also have the honor to invite you to officially open this special lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's main universities. And I would like to say, say thank you to Kasset Saak University for hosting our event today. Having started in September last year, Bridges will now be continuously held in Thailand and Singapore until March 2015, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The fifth ASEAN series of Bridges follows the series of 500 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already facilitated in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, and Vietnam since 2003 as an independent contribution to the decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. 42 Nobel laureates, as well as 20 other keynote speakers and artists, including Dr. Hans Blix, Chucky Chan, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, Jesse Norman, President Romano Prodi, the late Dame Manito Roddick, Oliver Stone, and Dr. James Wolfenson particip participated in these events. Many events in Thailand were presided over by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit and Her Royal Highness Princess Mahachakri Sirithorn, and they reached an audience of 160,000 participants. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time. Bridges has not been organized as a single conference, but as an ongoing series of events in which Nobel laureates and international decision makers have built strong bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized Bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 137 national and international institutions, including 70 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of Bridges in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and of the events now, reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and the environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, Bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, by developing innovative forms of cooperation, and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new life. The globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure, to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. 
Therefore, let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer. An opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected, and comprehensive view of ourselves and the world in which we live in, in which we are able to create a new constantly through dialogues towards a culture of peace, which need the particip participation of everyone. I thank the 2010 Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, Professor Eiichi Negishi, and his wife, Sumire, who have kindly agreed to come to Thailand to support the events, and we look forward to his speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Opunmakap. Thank you, Mr. Norbert. May I ask you to remain on stage? Could you please? And for now, may I invite uh, the Vice President of Kasesat University, Silasha Campus Associate Professor, Dr. Badim Rasami, to present the token of appreciation to you, Mr. Uwe Morowitz. Distinguished guests, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is really my privilege to be with you today and to lead, deliver my congratulations speech to Professor Dr. A. G. Medici, 2010 Nobel Prize laureate for chemistry. First, I would like to thank Kasesa University for creating this very special event and to Professor Dr. A. G. Mokishi for coming a long way from home to join us here today. Being a Nobel Prize laureate is undoubtedly the standard of being a scientist. It's a proof that years of perseverance finally transcend into something that can make a lasting difference for the betterment of mankind. I personally believe that this world-renowned accomplishment of one of the results of exceptional educational system. If you study Professor Nagy's biography, you will see that his solid foundation was forged in Japan in one of the world's best academic institutions. Some of you may already know that I was extremely fortunate I have spent some of my early years as a postgraduate student in Japan. It was an eye-opening and a life-changing experience for me. I came to realize that Japan and Thailand share very really similar beginnings. We both opened our countries to Western civilization throughout the late 1800s. And our first step was to establish which Western-style institution to accommodate the influx of new basic technology, such as the waterwork, the locomotive, and the electricity. Among those things, Japan came up with a new paradigm shift in academia. Founding Tokyo University, the first imperial university that also marked the glorious start of the Meiji educational revolution. The next 50 years, we saw the expansion of this education revolution that gave birth to another eight imperial university across the country, one after the other. On the other hand, 30 years after Tokyo University was conceived, Thailand finally had our first university, the Chuaronggon University. It then took another 30 years for Thailand to establish the second and the third university. Of course, as I said, music was the one of them. This is the main reason. Is this the main reason that Japan and Thailand start to drift apart from the education and industrialization viewpoint? Equipped with so the educational and scientific groundwork, Japan sprang into technically technical excellence that drove the country to where it is today. And Thailand is well lacking quite behind. I believe it's a scientific impulse that drove us apart. 
I'm certain that everyone here understands the beauty of science. One bat, seemingly small, big too, can read to revolutionary gigantic proportion across a myriad of industrial. For example, Professor Nikichi's palladium catalyst catalyzed reaction. Not only did it take not only did it check the foundation of synthetic chemistry to the core, it also sent tremor to other areas. For instance, biology, agriculture, and electronics. This is, a, this is why a country without scientific research capability will never be able to experience rapid and sustainable improvement in the quality of life. I use the question what would happen if Thailand did not wait for 30 years before we create our first university? Would those last years make up for our delay? And what if we can start once again now? And today, ladies and gentlemen, we PTT group will reinvigorate the scientific landscape of Thailand. We will provide a place where talented and gifted students can blossom and creating something truly groundbreaking for the world. PTT is committed to build Thailand's first and ever scientific research university and a science high school in Royong province. Both school and university will commence their first class in a few in a few months from now. And we hope that this will kickstart the first wave of our education reform that will help accelerate Thailand's development on the basis of technological advancement. Once it's not directly the private sector's responsibility to improve education or to develop scientists, I believe that there is an implied duty for PTT to contribute in this long-term human resource development that is so essential to our nation. PTT is a resource-based company which relies on the diminishing fossil resources. Therefore, we will need to transform ourselves into a knowledge-based organization to survive. But how can we do that without the best scientists and innovators? The answer to this question is rather simple. We need scientists and scientists only emerge from having the top of the class educational foundation. My dream is to create, to completely recuperate our past and to cultivate science in the next 20 years. Hopefully by then, Thailand can once again stand beside Japan like it once did back in the 1800s. Let me finish off by commending Professor Dr. Negishi for his dedication to science and to the world. May he continue his work with undiminishing vigor. His, um, his accomplishment will remind us that human's body can always be pushed. Strong will and determination always prime. And may it be the inspiration to everyone in this room. Thank you very much. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Shushot I want to remain on the stage, but at the same time, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Badi. to give the opening speech to declare this event officially opening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Vadim Rasami. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Nobel laureate, Professor Nitishi, the president and CEO of PTT, our major sponsor. 
and uh, the president of International Peace Foundation, uh, to Uwe. Yeah, I like asking by call him by first name because he speaks Thai very well, so I will just call him by his Thai name. Yeah, welcome to Kasesa University. This is the second uh, Monday of the two series of the Nobel Laureate that come here into Kasesa University. On behalf of Kasesa University, we are very happy for you, the participant, to get a great chance to be experience, experiencing one of the great minds in the century. I think last time, if you come here, I said that uh, education is the language of peace. Today I will say it again, but I will say, simply I will say, science is also a language of peace. So today is another day, another good day, that you will have an experience to listen to one of the great minds in this century. Uh, to make things short, for those of you who never come to Kasesa University, let me take this opportunity to tell you a little bit. Give me 15 seconds, because we have a lot of students here. I want to recruit them to come here to Kasesa University. We are one of the biggest closed university in the country. Closed means we have to take nature and science examination. We have 67,000 students, about 13,000 professors and staff. We have four campuses, and we are very happy to recruit you and let you take the part at Kasesa University. For those students who are listening today, if you are interested in next year, you apply for Kasesa University. And as you already know, okay, we have such a great speech last week, and then today we probably have the same, we will have the same speech and great idea come out of this meeting. So to make things short, I would like to declare the opening of the special lecture from Professor Nikishima, the Nobel Laureate. Thank you very much, and hope everybody enjoy this uh, speech. Thank you, Professor Gavin Nelson. And now I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Pihak Shio Wong to give us a brief CV of Professor. Yeah, pardon me for this cue. I guess I'm so excited to go to listen to his talk. So, uh, Professor Aishi is a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1963 under the supervision of Professor Alan Day. In 1966, a postdoctoral research at Purdue University in Indiana and became an assistant professor in 1968, working with Nobel laureate Herbert C. Brown. And in 1972, he went on to become associate professor at Syracuse University in New York, where in 1979, he was promoted to full professor. In the same year, he went back to Purdue University and spent most of his career at Purdue University in the United States. He is best known for his discovery of the Nikishi coupling, a very versatile reaction for the carbon-carbon bond formation. He was awarded the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for palladium catalyzed cross couplings in organic synthesis, jointly with Richard F. Peck and also Akira Suzuki. Now it's time for the special lecture to begin. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2010 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, Professor Aishi Dengchi. Good afternoon. Well, I'd like to, uh, it's my pleasure to be here to present my talk, share our uh, enthusiasm in uh, research in chemistry. But before that, I'd like to thank all the organizers, including the uh, World Peace Organization, whatever you call. <laughs> and, and all the uh, people here at the Kansasa University, and maybe perhaps some um, visitors here. Well, uh, I'd like to begin with uh, I have uh, a few Purdue t-shirts <laughs> to give out. <laughs> and uh, I thought I should just reverse the order of uh, my presentation. Before, before I, I open my, pre uh, 
form of presentation, I'd like to begin with a question and an answer or a quiz. And uh, whoever, whoever finds the correct answer to this one, of course, I only have a few issues. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to present that perhaps at the end. Okay, so the uh, question is this. Here you see, let me see. Oh, yeah. So here you see carbon carbon double bond. Hopefully everybody knows this. <laughs> and then this carbon has CH3, one CH3, and one hydrogen shown here. On the other side, it's the same. Okay? And now, hundred, some hundred, fifteen years ago, uh, the first Nobel Prize winner, uh, Van Hoff, Van Hoff questioned about the extension of this structure. But this one, as you know, is best shown in this way. This, and then everything in C, 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 your four C's and two hydrogens here are in the same plane, as you know. This is all, all of it, flat. Okay? Then he questioned if, you, if we extend the accumulation of this double bond, CC, double bond. Just by one more, you have this compound called aline. What should be the structure of this aline in a three-dimensional state? That's my question. That was his question. And he theorized, and 115 years ago, maybe people were somewhat lucky, <laughs> luckier than today. He won the Nobel Prize. Of course, he did not anymore. Okay, and he didn't stop here. By the way, this is called an aline. This is called alkene, as you know. Okay, he didn't stop here. Very fine scientist. He kept going. So if you add one more double bond here, one double bond here, two double bonds, Accumulated, three double bonds accumulated. And he found the rule. He came up with a very nice rule. And how these compounds, you can, add, you can keep adding many more. The structure of these cumulin, accumulated all of them down. Okay? And my my challenge for some of you, for Purdue Fisher, is that, okay, so this is a flat all of it. Everybody knows it. Okay. But surprisingly few people may have thought about this one more carbon uh, accumulated. In other words, this carbon is inserted in, in the middle. C, C, C. What is the structure? of this thing. I want you to draw this thing on a sheet of paper and show it to me. If I, if I approve, then you okay, teacher. One more. Then you keep doing that. One more accumulation. So now we have one, two, three. Then what is the structure of this accumulated molecule? This one is this one is called the propadiene, better known as the cu uh, cumulin. Uh, but, so this one is a, a buta, buta trine, buta trine. Buta, because C4, then three double bond, buta trine. So, I just want you to draw two structures like this, here and here, or on your sheet of paper and show it to me. Okay. But in view of time, I think I should start and then the, this one, I will come back to this at the end of, of my presentation. 
question. Okay, so this is how or Nobel Prize history in organic chemistry started. First Nobel Prize. Second Nobel Prize in chemistry went to arguably the historically the best organic synthet synthetic organic chemistry, uh, Emil Fischer. He was able to synthesize back in those days, uh, 19th century. He won in 1902. All kinds of sugar and uh, complex molecules. But his chemistry was not catalytic. His chemistry was stoichiometric. Okay. So catalytic chemistry did not, had not started. But it's amazing, even today, it's amazing to, to know what he was able to do. About 10 years later, French chemist by the name of Victor Grignard, you may know him, you know, you may, you may know his name. Grignard won, together with, uh, oh, my, his name <laughs> often disappears from my head. But anyway, Grignard won the Nobel Prize, together with another Frenchman. He, he actually started catalytic organometallic metal containing compounds chemistry. Sabatier, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sabatier is his name. Okay, that's how this catalytic, catalytic organic synthesis started. And of course, there are many, many great chemists after that. But I will point out that uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, in in uh, Italy, uh, Monte Catini, uh, Nata, and uh, anyway, this, they came up with uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, which instantly became a big industry. Even today, it's a multi billion dollar industry worldwide. Almost uh, 60, you know, more than half a century later. But in this Sigla Nata, I'm sorry, in Germany, in, in Germany, Sigla, Sigla and the Nata, uh, this Sigla Nata chemistry, uh, organic compound, there are, there are absolute stereochemistry so-called absolute finest, you know, at the finest level. Absolute stereochemistry was not a big issue. The, what they were concerned about was, you know, polyethylene, you know this polyethylene, CH2, 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 chain. If every other chain has methyl pendant, methyl CH3 pendant, this methyl pendant, if you stretch polyethylene chain, may be leaning towards you, next one may be leaning towards you, next one may be leaning towards you in an extended zigzag, zigzag form. Then it is called iso, iso means the same, isotactic. So this leaning, the uh, angle, the point, direction of methyl group leaning is called the this. So they were interested in this, but they weren't interested in absolute stereochemical tactics. Okay, I will explain that more. On the other hand, if one methyl goes this way, the second methyl goes that way, and then the third one goes this way, and so on, then it's called a syndiotactic, syndiotactic, which is of course interesting, but my point is that in a singular Nata chemistry, and both of them won the Nobel Prize in 1963, uh, tacticity was very, very important. But absolute chemistry was not important. That's what you know, we, there is this absolute stereochemistry which we need to deal with. So later, uh, Noyori, 
and uh, uh, Sharpless, they started talking about this absolute stereochemistry. And they won the Nobel Prize in 2001, along with uh, uh, industrial chemists, Bill Knowles. So, progress in organic synthesis with the uh, attention to absolute stereochemistry came very, very, very slowly. Why do we have to pay our attention? absolute stereochemistry. Because most of the compounds, biologically important compounds, which are also organic compounds, they, they have the absolute stereochemistry. And if the absolute stereochemistries are not uh, well taken care of, then you may be making a different kind of compound, or you may be making a toxic as in the case of thalidomide, some of you, many of you know. Okay, maybe I, sh I start showing some of these things. Oops. Uh, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Stereochemistry has provided us chemists major challenge. And as I said, Sigla Nata, Poly Alkene Polymerase uh, preparation, they weren't interested in our absolute stereochemistry. They were interested in only the relative stereochemistry. If one means was you, second one. If second one means also towards you, third one also. Then it's called the isotactic. There's also another one, syntiotactic. One goes this way, second one goes this way, and the third one goes this way. There is some regularity, but uh, then there again, absolute stereochemistry is not an issue. Okay, but, okay, uh, as I said, amino acid. Peptide, they're from, or DNAs, RNAs, all these biologically important compounds, many, many of them. They have the absolute, stere absolute stereochemistry of their own. And if we make a mistake, or slight mistake, or some mistake, we may be in trouble. That was vividly demonstrated in uh, artificial industrial synthesis of tranquilizer for the uh, thalidomide. So uh, being able to control the absolute stereochemistry is a very, very big issue. Now, we, when we deal with organic synthesis, I have been proposing we should be paying uh, serious attention to yields. In other words, you put in 100 parts of uh, starting compound, and if you get out of 100 part of, parts of a product, then we say yield is 100%, which is kind of rare, but yield is a very, very important issue. Efficiency. You synthesize a drug or whatever fabric in the fabrics, if it takes many, many, many steps, then it's, it's not going to be very economical. So it's very, so efficiency stems from a very smaller the number of steps than we usually call synthesis more efficient, highly efficient. And the cell activity is, of course, they are all linked together, uh, as I was, have been explaining. So 
one, one uh, desired stereochemistry, isotactic or syndiotactic. But now we have to add one more, one more quality, stereochemical quality, absolute stereochemistry. That was not considered in Siegel and Adam. Okay, and of course, our synthesis should be economical. And last but not least, as vividly demonstrated, unfortunately, in the case of pyridomine, or, or Japanese know this uh, cadmium poison, itai itai disease, or minamata disease, mercury poison. So all these must be carefully uh, taken care of. Okay, so I say, I learned this from uh, President Obama when he was trying to become president several years ago. So he said, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so yield Y, oops, yield Y, efficiency E, selectivity, yes, yes. Now I have never been able to find the second Y word. There were very few Y words. Help me if you have good ones. The second E, economic economy, and second S, safety. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so I believe that uh, any good synthesis should satisfy these five keywords. That's what we call green. Okay, so how to do that? Well, quickly consider all usable elements. There are 112 or so elements in the periodic table. And some are toxic, some are radioactive, or that's also toxic. So we get to use about 70. I'll show you. And, uh, and 70, if 70 is a small number, too small for you, then I say you begin thinking of binary, there are binary combinations. 70 times 70, that's almost 5,000. Then you have your option for synthesis will increase all of a sudden from 70 to 5,000. If you get the same compound in the end, then in the meantime, you are uh, maybe making the synth synthesis green. That's the goal. But Above all, I have been emphasizing one of the very important key is the catalysis. catalysis. Okay. And by catalysis, does the wonderful things in organic synthesis. And they are fundamentally, they are not used, used up, so they can be recycled. But in, you know, with time, they gradually die. But uh, I hope you know, let me just quickly tell you that uh, we all must use catalyst, so-called transition metal catalyst. We all, we all, we do every day. <laughs> Some of you may say, uh -huh, yeah, I know what that is. And what are the catalysts? Let me just uh, go to the next one. Okay, here it is. So I have been saying that some of the better kinds, best kinds of catalyst sources are here, shown in the periodic table. This one is an extended periodic table, modified in my way, dissected, and so on. So, But here it is, three times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Three times eight, 24, minus this, uh, Radioactive artificial element, technetium. Take away that. <coughs> technetium. We still are left with 23 D block. This block is for the D block. D block transition metal. I say, more cleverly we use D block transition metals, we will make our world, our society, better. And in fact, I should go to so far as to say that we must, we must use these D-block transition metals, 23 of them, as catalysts. And as I was telling you, 
uh, we all use every day four or five, maybe, several of the most expens expensive metals. And uh, I want someone, a student, younger student, to raise hand to tell me what that is. Okay. So we use every day. We are forced to. You may not be jailed, but uh, you may not be able to drive if you don't do that. Gold here. Yeah. Everybody knows gold is very expensive. And the platinum, perhaps even more expensive in some cases. Platinum. And then the palladium, which is the element that I love very much, as you may know. So palladium is also used. And also extensive one. I mean, this may be more. Comparably expensive. Uh, expensive. Iridium. So these four, plus maybe one or, one or two. Can any young people raise hand and tell me what they are they are used for? Anyone? Fishes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Time up. <laughs> Time's up. Okay. So these several variants of the most expensive D-block transition metals are used as a super catalyst in uh, emission, although emission control device in the dirtiest part of, of your uh, car, muffler. So when CO comes through the engine and it goes through that device, then out go, goes CO2, not CO, or NO will instantly be converted to NO2, and so on. And so emission, emission dev uh, control device. With uh, these, so, and uh, some, some of you may, may already be thinking, how come can we use such an expensive metal for such a trivial thing. Every day, presumably, there are about uh, 7 billion cars uh, running in the world. <laughs> okay. But this is true. Only because you, you only need a tiny, tiny, finely divided particle, small amount, dispersed in the emission control, the muffler. There goes these NO and CO and so on. The outcomes, well, of course, CO2 is becoming a bad, you know, bad guy, but CO2 is better than CO2. Okay. So, I hope I can, with that, I can uh, convince you that, oh, geez, how can we do that? How can because they serve as a catalyst. They never to totally disappear or convert it into something else. They are in the device, constantly recycled, and then uh, they survive. But I have never, never replaced the muffler of my car. Uh, a long time ago I did, when I was having a <laughs> very old car. But nowadays, I may be driving uh, several years, or ten, some, some of some cars, ten years. And you know how much waste gas must, must have passed through that. That's, so this is one of the most wonderful, you know, fantastic uh, catalytic devices. And uh, I'm sure you all know. Okay, so what I have decided to do when I was uh, in my 40s, well, let's just explore D-block transition metal as catalyst. Okay, so that's how, that's how I decided to, uh, that's what I decided to do. I came, when I was 26, actually, when, at the University of Pennsylvania, 
they're going to be out. I said, organic synthesis. Why is it so complex, so cumbersome? It's time consuming and complicated. You know. Can't we make it simpler, first of all? And can't we make it more generally applicable? So out came uh, uh, an idea which I stole from a Lego game maker. Lego game. If we can do organic synthesis in the manner of Lego game. In a Lego game, you have all kinds of pieces with a, with a hole, and all other kinds of pieces with a stick. You can make anything with two kinds of Lego game. That, so you bring the two pieces, appropriately shaped two pieces, and then snap it. Now you have this much, and you keep doing that. You can make a house, you can make a doll, you can make a car, anything. I said, my oh my, shouldn't we do organic synthesis in this way? So he, that was my idea. And uh, so basically, I thought of mixing R1, R's are reserved by chemists for expressing organic groups. <laughs> organic groups are R. R1, bonded to metal. Metals are electron pushing back, so electron, er, electron positive, which makes R1, R1 minus, with a stick, Lego game. Uh, piece with a stick. And another one, R2, different one, we may attach electron pulling, averaging. Then R2 becomes electron deficient, so this is, is an R2 uh, plus. Okay. So R, R uh, negative uh, charge con containing R1 and the positive charge containing R2. Six, O. Bring them, then you form the bond. I checked, I went to the library, and I found that the Grignard, I mentioned his name, 1912 Nobel Prize winner. Grignard came up with his Grignard reagent chemistry. So, I thoroughly checked the literature. Oops. Damn it. No, no, no. Sorry. So, using the green reagent, that is magnesium, you can do hardly anything when these R groups are unsaturated. Aromatic, alkenyl, alkynyl, these kinds of groups, we cannot do that. I was very disappointed. When they are so called alkyl or acyl, sometimes it works, but not very good. So I was very disappointed. Then it came, you know, I thought of this Lego game thing. Then I thought of catalysis. They went to Catalyst. Then what happened? Look at it. So, so this is like this, from this, to this, for the same, same, uh, you know, top. So, some of my colleagues, or senior colleagues, or sometimes well-known chemists visiting us, started saying, wow, that looks like a magic. Oops. Uh, from this to this. Well, it's not perfect. And so we first came up with this thing, 1976. And, uh, you know, it took us a long time, like 2010. Uh, Nobel Foundation recognized this. And, uh, moment for me. Anyway. So what
what was the critical thing that came from some Japanese group here. Uh, Tamao, uh, Kumada, and Hayashi, I understand, coming here. Is this catechs, use of a catechs. In our hands, we screened about 10 of them. Palladium came out as a winner. We do use palladium in many cases. But sometimes we also use copper. We also use uh, nickel. I'm out of nickel. But anyway, that's how we discovered. Why, why are these things so so useful as catalysts? Let me just briefly tell you. Okay, so. Here, you have alkane pH bundle. Two electrons here, two electrons, two, 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 eight electrons. No empty orbital or no nothing, no other thing. And if you mix these two compounds, alkane and alkene, uh, under mild conditions, nothing happens. Under wild conditions, they may go polymerize, but nothing happens. This is no good. But if you convert, manage to convert this two, four, six, eight, eight electron species by pulling two electrons out, then it becomes a six electron species called the carbocation, carbocation, or sexy sexy. Now these two interact like crazy. And then you form a carbon carbon bond. This is one of the key. But if you replace this carbon with metal, boron, and then boron, so if you look at this shape, one, two, four, six, two, four, six, eight, and one empty orbital, turn out that these boranes react like crazy in a similar manner. This is the mechanism of Professor Brown's hydroboration. And this empty orbital containing boron is a critical thing with which he won his Nobel Prize in 1979. But turned out that boron is not the only thing. Any, many, many metals, they can be, they can provide empty orbital and do the same or similar things. Okay, so hydrozirconation was thus discovered. Now you can see this electron counting is very, very important. Okay, but what, uh, what was very important finding, and what was uh, turned out to be a very important finding is that if you think, you learn that acid, acid and with empty orbital, a base that can donate two electrons, if you mix acid and base, then you get a salt, right? Acid. So HCl and Na, uh, H, HCl and NaOH, acid and base. You mix it, you get an NaCl salt. Okay, but the Chinese group at Charmen, not long ago, but I think they have been working on this thing for a long time, published a very important paper here which said, if you just mix acid with empty oil and a base with a two electron, they should react very fast, but no, 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 no. There is a barrier to go over, barrier to go over. That's what they said. This is a barrier, strong barrier. They made a very nice theoretical uh, work, made a very nice theoretical work, and they identified all these elements of interaction between acid and bases. Okay. And particularly, they noticed this one. And let me t tell you what this bad guy, uh, energy raising bad guy is. Very simple, but you have to be careful. As acid A and the base B, they begin to form a bond. They reach now here, 
at this stage, critical stage. Careful, carefully listen. Now, as acid has begun accepting these two electrons, electrons are negative, of course. So, this acid center will be partially negatively polarized, right? Partially negatively polarized. Base, on the other hand, as it begins to send a pair of electrons to the acid, then it begins to lose electrons. Therefore, it will become positively polarized because electrons are negative. As it begins to lose, then it should be positively polarized. This is a critical moment. What is the effect of this delta minus negative, negative polarization on the incoming a moving pair of electrons? This said, don't count. Why? Because electrons are negative. And it is already negatively polarized. Negative and negative, they begin repelling. It began attracting, and then after a while, it, so that's shown here. The B, likewise, it, it began sending these two electrons, but as it begins to lose this electron for sharing, then it will be positively polarized, and then this positive charge will pull back, try to pull back the electron. Please listen to me carefully. This is very, very, very fundamental. Okay, so that will raise this energy, transition energy, very high. Okay, so uh, what is the answer? How to overcome this? Answer came from Fukui, Dewar, Hoffman, Woodward. These, they are prime, the theoretical chemists and organic chemists. They solve the problem. This is a very, very, very important principle. So we were talking about this part, uh, so base and acid. They said use, use metal or use transition. And uh, in this scheme, this is all of alkene. This is a transition metal. The beauty of transition metal is that, is that they can have low-lying empty orbital white one and somewhat below, they can also have high-lying high -line, uh, orbital. Uh, I should say somewhat above. <laughs> okay, so transition metals are both both acid and the base. That's the, that's the beauty of it. Of course, every element may have uh, such possibilities, but uh, much more practically uh, available uh, structure. As structure, like, we can show this. Okay, so now inside, all of in this pi bond, two, ele pi bond, two electrons can be donate, donated to empty orbital of the metal. Right? But that alone, we learn that, that that alone is a high energy process. But suppose transition metal can back donate from bottom, not from bottom up, but from top down. Two electrons from top to down where? Empty, so so this is a non-bonding, uh, non-bonding empty orbit, which chemists didn't use to consider before 1981. But Fukui uh, and uh, Dua, or actually Fukui was the first one to consider this so-called low, lowest unoccupied uh, empty uh, orbit. So by combining, remember, two inside, two electrons up, outside, two electrons can go down. What this means is that ill effect of the polarization 
can be cancelled, all but cancelled. This is, this is the essence of D-block transition metal catalysis. This is, and this is, with this, Fukui and Hoffman won Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1981. Sorry, you are missed it. I wish he should have, no, I think he should have won. He did. Woodward, for other, for other expertise, he won. <laughs> anyway, so this is a very, very, very important scheme which tells us what D-block transition metal can do because they can provide both empty orbital and the field non-bonding field orbital. Very effective. Any element can do in principle, but very effective. But if you accept this two, two electrons up, two electrons down scheme, then you can readily understand why Professor Brown's hydroboration is so fast. All of in here, all on hydride here, inside, pi bond and the boron empty orbital, two electrons can go up. In the meantime, simultaneously, boron hydride, two electrons, can be back donated to the pi star orbit. Now we can say pi star orbit. Now we understand why tidal operation is so fast. It doesn't, doesn't, uh, is not limited to boron. It can be aluminum or many, many other elements. And then I learned, I, then I came in. If uh, hydrogen can occupy this position, there are many other elements that can occupy this position in the periodic table. How about carbon? Carbon metal bond, they can do two up, two down. And we have found all through of carbometallation, what we call a carbometallation reaction. This one also works. So now it's all new uh, world. And uh, I think that's about the only thing I can discuss today. But let me see. Let me say, finish with my braggadocio <laughs> bragging. So you may have heard about the Co CoQ10. I've been suggested to take one every every day. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> but now we have the first uh, very efficient uh, CoQ10 synthesis, which went to my friend uh, Bruce Lips Lipschitz. And Kaneka Chemical in Japan uh, uh, have been uh, making this by fermentation first, but now they are trying to switch this. <laughs> they consider it. So these, all these complex looking molecules can be readily synthesized. And now these kinds, we have just synthesized Sorry, uh, this, <laughs> of course, you can use this one. And ours is the third major synthesis. I think with this I will stop. First one came in from Netherlands. It, it took about 30 steps. 30 steps, not efficient, not economical. I must say, it's, it, ha it doesn't have much future. Then came, another one came from uh, Switzerland. And it is 15, 16 steps. Oh, so sorry, tw tw uh, close to 20 steps. Still long, but that was the best one until we came up with our ours. But we have, ours hasn't been published yet. We can synthesize this thing three parallel things of eight longest linear steps. This is by far the most efficient one. We can synthesize them. And as you can see here, this looks this looks like a polypropylene, polypropylene. But in our case, we care about absolute stereochemistry. But I think I should stop. So 
we came up, we discovered. So here we discovered the zirconium chemistry. And uh, so this one, my friend uh, at the uh, University of Tokyo, Kenji Mori, synthesized. So uh, acid component of green gland maps of gray light blue cancer and so All my group members have. <laughs> anyway, Kenji Mori synthesized this one more than 20 years before we synthesized. So they, theirs was the first synthesis, requiring 20 steps, 20 steps. This is touted as a super grease, but 20 steps and 1 or 2 percent yield efficiency was not, not good. So we came up with new reaction. And uh, we synthesized this thing. One, two, three, four, five. Then we are here. And six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten steps. Twelve percent even. I believe and this is a very, very uh, efficient synthesis. And we're very proud of this already done almost 10 years. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not a money maker. But we are still enjoying and uh, we have conquered almost all the bastions uh, trying to prevent our uh, invasion. Uh, but uh, I think we have pretty much conquered them all. So, let me just tell you. So, this is one of the, yeah, this is one of the most difficult compounds to synthesize, pure. And uh, this, you know, this is the compound. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Very remote place. The difference is minuscule. This, and this side goes CH2, CH3, ethyl. This side is CH2, CH2, CH3, mess, uh, uh, propyl, propyl. So they're almost uh, the same and remote. Very difficult. And people consider it to be impossible to synthesize this one. But in our hand, with our new reaction, new chemistry. No problem. As you can see, we made it as pure, very, very, very pure. So uh, that means only uh, triplet, three signals here, and the three signals here correspond to this. If this were impure at this point slightly, then the other signals should sneak in. Maybe, yeah, but. Well, we don't see anything, but some people may suspect what it is. <laughs> That's where we are, and uh, we are very, very pleased with the uh, current stage of uh, this debug transition level. Uh, oh, okay, so someone was commenting about this uh, uh, Nagishi Brown uh, lab. <laughs> this uh, that building was recognized by American Chemical Society earlier, earlier last year, earlier last year. And uh, some of my group members, uh, mostly uh, from South and East Asia. Oops. Thank you. carry back my t-shirts. <laughs> so I see the hand over there. Oh. <laughs> okay, so let's give the opportunity to a gentleman. Uh, 
Hey everyone, my name is Muhammad Amir and I'm from Pakistan. Uh, Thank you. Of the next one, please. The gentleman holding that arm. Yeah, yeah, please. Green yeah, piece of paper. <laughs> please stand up, please. And the way that you, yeah. You will never forget <laughs> what you answered. You're going to have to bring the answer down. Yes, sir. Okay, we got already one lady. All right, here she is. Any students can solve this problem, but uh, 115 years ago, in Van Gogh's time, it was a Nobel
carbon then this if you keep this end flat and the other end must become perpendicular what this means is that it could be optical activity possible very very simple but profound implication now if you add one more you insert one more cup two cup then it goes back to end part goes back to this flat. Okay. okay. They all come. Basis for his winning very first Nobel Prize, 1901. Okay, so good luck, all of you. Okay, we have the winner introduce themselves and the photo on stage. So one by one we'll introduce yourself. For the first one, what's your name and where are you from? And the audience. My name is Kandavit Pentewalan Kovit. I am the Super YC from Northern Kasha Wong. 
Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah, and his advice is uh, from the Department of Chemistry at ASI University. Yeah, the first one. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chan Chai Sam Mai. Uh, now I'm a PhD candidate from the Mahidol University. Mahidol University. Uh, good afternoon, everybody and professor. I, my name is Achala Pantanti Banjapon. I come from Mahidol University and uh, under guidance of Professor Palongpon Kung Seri. Hi everyone, my name is Prabhupon Sobongkot. I come from IPST. I'm working in the uh, chemistry department as an academic officer staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, all the winners. So uh, now it's time for the audience. If you have any questions for Professor uh, Eng Chi, please identify yourself. Yes, hand, please. Could be anything. Doesn't really have to be related to chemistry. Anything at all that you want to ask, Professor. Oh, <laughs> okay. In a moment, after the photo time. You have one question now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I hope for from Faculty of Social Science. Uh, I have some question to ask the professor, Egishi. I think chemistry is a very hard subject in, when we learn. I want to know how you simplify my opinion by focusing our attention on the very basic things, basic number of basic things must be much far less than, far less than, uh, which is amazing. Madame Curie won uh, two Nobel Prizes for discovering uh, a few, two, two new elements. Wonderful contribution, I'm not trying to take take anything out away from that. But when I learned, that, uh, when I visited uh, Moscow, uh, uh, Mendeleev Institute, if you go there, please make sure to visit that, that place. I showed a picture. Mendeleev discovered 11, 11 elements, long before Madame Curie. Only problem with him is that there was no Nobel Prize. <laughs> the 11 element is about 10% of the whole universe. And the number, current number, 112, 113, I think is uh, staying still. You know, in Japan, uh, uh, moon shooting rockets and so on, space shooting, you know, exploring rockets are occasionally shot. And then they bring some uh, stone, so on. They analyze. Nothing, nothing has been found outside 112 or 13. We, we now know. So that's about uh, that's about the limit. And for for most of us, for if you want to make use of chemistry. Uh, I would say 100 to 12, 113 is enough. And then as I said, we typically eliminate radioactive elements, uh, a whole bunch of them, and the toxic elements, about seven or eight of them, cadmium, uh, uh, mercury, uh, you know, all these uh, 
that makes a pretty toxic. So you don't want to use them over your for our daily use. So first, my first uh, suggestion is or belief is that uh, we should stay uh, with the basics, and uh, but having just said that, we should of course include this D-block transition levels, as I have been emphasizing, emphatically telling you. And uh, there, uh, we have some intuition, in intuition, but we don't mind the screening, for instance, 10 to dozen transition metal uh, catalyst candidates. That's easy. But the basics are more difficult things, but fundamentals, if, as we learn, you know, like, like the significance of Lumo, found by Fukui. You know, I understand that he was doing this during the World War II. <laughs> but later, uh, strongly influenced the Hoffman and the Woodward and so on. So today, anymore, everybody must know the significance of Lumo. And what the transition metal catalyst, as I have been, as I, I was telling you, Tell, uh, tell us is, is it's the combination of the two. Empty orbital pulling electrons and the LUMO uh, pushing electron back. Push pull. Push pull action will lower the kinetic barrier substantially and make everything goes like crazy. With our palladium catalyst, we can turn over reaction easily million times. And across a billion times, we have done that. Then, if, if, if something costs, if some precious catalyst costs a million dollars or more, if we can turn over a million times, it is just a buck or more, as Americans say. <laughs> so that's the beauty of catalyst. Catalysis holds uh, still a key, key position in chemistry into the future. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, my name is Hun Song Kong Tati from the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Science, SA Science University. Um, we know that many of the known catalyst compound has been used together with palladium in the coupling reactions. For example, the organo warren in Suzuki reactions, organo T steel reaction, and of course, organo C in the reaction. Can you tell us the advantages and disadvantages of organo C compared to the organo borrelic acid? In the Suzuki reaction. Well, let me first uh, tell you that uh, all of those we have we discovered before before they discovered. <laughs> and then, well, first of all, uh, uh, tin. Don't steal this tin. Tin is toxic. Tin is toxic. So my industrial chemical you know, uh, friends, they will tell me we cannot use tin. That is a big, big role. But uh, beyond that, the scope of the scope of organic tin cross coupling is considerably more limited. Scientifically, chemically, by far the most broadly applicable is zinc. We have, as I said, we discover them all. I mean, we compare them okay, at least two years before they start. And uh, boron, boron is, uh, is uh, of course, very useful element. You know, I came from uh, the same boron school, H.C. Brown boron school. But uh, I didn't push boron because 
as a disciple of Professor Brown, in America at least, people were very much against my using Bohr. <laughs> as, as a long time associate of H.C. Brown, Nigishi uh, shouldn't be using Bohr. <laughs> he, should, he should go out and do something else. So I reluctantly did that. But that's the consequence. And uh, we, we did screen. We did carefully compare zinc and boron. Chemically. No question. Zinc is more, more generally applicable. More, can be more highly uh, selective and so on. So scientifically, there's no, no comparison. And another thing is that nobody has ever found any toxicity associated with zinc <laughs> so far. Boron, boric acid, is a suspect. And uh, it, is, it is being checked. But in most cases, it should be okay. You know, I, I, am, I am a fundamental, you know, the boron chemist. <laughs> so I like boron. But uh, as I said, scientifically, Zinc wind in, in a turnover number or uh, uh, selectivity and so on. But uh, uh, bo boron, boron chemistry reactions are used. One of the biggest reasons is that uh, Professor Brown started the Borane Chemicals Company with Aldrich, president. And so many of them are, this is the one big advantage, many of them are, uh, you, you can purchase, you can buy. Buy and mix. People are lazy. So. <laughs> and also, uh, overall, overall uh, safety. I mean, uh, different kind of safety. So Organozinc compounds may be, you know, sensitive to air, and so you have to control the environment. Or hydrolysis, readily hydrolyzed, you have to control that process. And uh, you can be sloppy, much more sloppy with the uh, form. That's true. So that's the main, main reason. Commercial, commercial availability of reagents and uh, uh, ease, ease of you know, handling. You don't need to uh, scru scrupulously control the quality of the age. But uh, many, uh, still zinc is, some, many people say, last, past, you know, last uh, refugee, I mean, when most of all the other things don't work, people try zinc and then it works. So, but zinc, born, and several others, including zirconia. They all should be considered. And I don't care <laughs> if people use more, more, uh, more uh, bo boron, because deep, deep inside my heart, that was my discovery. <laughs> Up there. Good All right. Good afternoon, Professor Leiti. I'm right here for about chemistry. Uh, repeat the sec second part. Second part. Okay. What motivates you the most to discover and explore more about chemistry, uh -huh. or in your field? Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, so first question, did I did you anticipate, ever... anticipate winning the Nobel? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let me put it this way. I went to America when I was 25, I think so, <laughs> and uh, I was really surprised because like every month, every, every other month, Nobel Prize winners, like myself, come to the University of Pennsylvania. 
They will just give the seminar. Why? One of the Nobel Prize winners that I knew very well was in Japan was a Yukawa Hideki. You know, when I was uh, junior high or something. So Nobel Prize became very close to me. You know? And then uh, Crick Watson came to me and uh, the work just came. 1961, 62. At that time, I said, my gosh, biochemistry is such a fantastic field. I, I hated the biology because it was a classification and remembering names and so on and so forth. <laughs> a little, little intellectual uh, excitement. But the Crick was, which when it came out, 1961 or so, I said, my God, you know, I, I was so determined to switch from chemistry, organic chemistry, to biochemistry. And in fact, I applied for uh, uh, the one who won, won the Nobel Prize in 1961, uh, Calvin, 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 sorry, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And uh, I was a good student at the University of Pennsylvania. So, he immediately offered me, please come. You know, I was ready to go. Please come. But then a few things. He asked me, well, I asked all postdoctoral uh, workers to write a 10, 11 page short proposal, which I can use for getting an NIH postdoctoral uh, money. So I said, at that time, I was in the midst of a very, very important work at uh, my company, Teijin, in Japan. I, didn't, I couldn't think of allocating you know, two, ten, 10 days, two weeks for that purpose. But at the same time, I already had the offer from Professor Brown, H.C. Brown. And in fact, H.C. Brown was my first choice if until Lev and Levin Calvin won the Nobel Prize, so I went to original, my original. But that was a critical moment. But uh, what was your question again? <laughs> what motivates you to explore more about chemistry, or basically your field? What motivates you and inspires you? Well, there are, well, we all know. There are a ton of very highly needed, very challenging problem, chemical problems. And if you are knowledgeable, become more capable, wouldn't you be you know, drawn to those unsolved major challenges? Well, actually, even the CO2 reduction is becoming a Pretty really realistic, but it, nobody, no company has yet come up with a really uh, satisfactory CO2 reduction project. But uh, water splitting project, of all places, of all companies, uh, automakers have come up with a fantastic solution. Now, two, these two companies in Japan are selling, selling at significantly high price, but uh, automobile is running with water. Isn't that fantastic? It's like a, it's like a pretty expensive uh, uh, car, but uh, maybe you can save a lot of money <laughs> on gas, uh, fuel or something. Water. Okay, so when I think of all these things, I'm going to have to live uh, another 50 years. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a very exciting thing. All right, thank you very much.
second piece out, Kasesai University, token of appreciation. As a thank you on behalf of Kasesai University. Thank you. 